bisa listen to our yes and right now and he's a Colorado boy got his PhD at University of Colorado in ecology and evolutionary biology then he did a postdoc at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention and another postdoc at University of Sydney and he really is a true interdisciplinarian because he works on evolutionary genetics, microbial ecology, disease ecology, and ecosystems ecology. So it's great to have him in the program. Thanks. All right, thanks. <clears throat> yeah, Kathy and I previously were talking about me, and she we came up with the word poster boy for interdisciplinary research. <laughs> uh, Kathy said, if you're on a poster, you're either missing or wanted. <laughs> so I'm not a poster boy. I might be an she came up with an even better word, and that's icon. So I like that. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> so I challenge you to find a more interdisciplinary researcher in IOE. Um, so it's good to be here, and uh, glad to be part of the IOE and giving this talk. So I'm, today I'm going to talk about microbial ecology across Montana. So this is just some projects I've started in the year that I've been here um, across Montana, so from soils at Tenerife Creek to floodplains and Nyack floodplain and uh, native bees here in Bozeman. Um, so these are sort of the three, well, there's a, a, there's a fourth project that's in Iceland, so I'll just barely talk about it since it's outside of our geographic range, but um, these are the four projects I've really become part of over the last year here. So my interests are split. One, one side is ecosystem ecology, so what are the feedbacks between microbial communities and ecosystem processes like nutrient cycling, and how do those feed back into one another? And then my second interest is more insect-associated bacteria, microbes, especially of disease vectors. Um, and so insects and, and their bacteria are both affected by uh, future climate change, but maybe potentially not affected in the same way. And so how will, how will future change affect those relationships between each other, disease spread? Uh, pollination networks, that sort of that sort of thing. So the, the big question I'm, that drives my research is, what are the ecological factors that contribute to microbial community assembly, and then <clears throat> and then what are the functional consequences of shifts in those communities? So how do how do changing those communities lead to ecosystem or disease change or um, disease spread, that sort of thing? So if you're interested in nutrient cycles, you're thinking about carbon cycling, and almost or nitrogen, sulfur, all these are driven by microbes. And even if you're one of these people who thinks plants are important, they are only important because they had an endosymbiotic event where they took up a microbe and allowed them to photosynthesize. So even, even they're relying completely on a, on a microbe. So really the entire nutrient cycling of our planet is driven by microbes. So that's important. Uh, but then insect microbe interactions are really important. So if you're interested in the ecosystem services provided by insects like pollination, um, disease spread, agricultural pests, um, their microbes are actually important too because these pests or these insects form often obligate or, or if, not, if not obligate uh, facultative symbioses that affect insect survival and reproduction. And so they, those symbionts of the insects may respond differently to, to environmental change. Um, so today I'm going to just briefly go over sort of the um, molecular and analytical methods I use for a lot of a lot of my research, regardless of the system. And then I'm just going to talk about soil microbes. So I'll go over an early paper of mine uh, on a, a global perspective of of soil microbial diversity as sort of an introduction to the watershed scale, which is at uh, Tenderfoot Creek in northern Montana. And then second, I'm going to go over some insect-associated microbes, just some background, and then focus on the Montana Native Bee Project. And so. I'm embracing the rough part of the rough cut seminar. This was analyzed this morning and last week before <laughs> I, at the end of the week. So very preliminary uh, data, So, but I think really interesting. And I'm just going to talk briefly about this floodplain microbial ecology project in NIAC. So same thing that data was getting analyzed this morning and last week, um, but it's not as far along as the B project, it's about a day behind. Um, and then some, the effect of temperature on sediment microbes in Iceland, and so that's it's a really cool project, but it's just going to be one slide today. Okay, so when we characterize microbes, historically, the way you would characterize microbes until, say, 30 years ago was what they were interested in what's living in this mosquito, crush them up, thread them on a, on a on an agar plate, and see what grows. And 
look at this, we've got a green and a red species. So there's two species and dominated by green bacteria. And if you're, I guess if you're colorblind, maybe you have one. <laughs> um, and then we realized that that was a really terrible way of characterizing microbes because most of them are not easily cultured. And so uh, we developed techniques. Uh, we, I wasn't really part of it, but um, techniques were developed to characterize microbial communities using a more DNA sequence approach. And so clone libraries were used to generate DNA sequence data, and that was a much, much better way of, of characterizing microbial communities. Um, the problem with that is sort of tedious and, and expensive. Um, so then in about 2008, there was this major breakthrough for microbial ecology. And that was this, this uh, development of bar-tagged pyrosequencing. And so the idea here is that you can add one of these, I've got a color coded and say an ACCT here. You add a barcode to your primer that you're amplifying the sample from. And what that allows you to do is you can combine Six or a hundred or a thousand samples into a single PCR into a single sequencing reaction, and though, so instead of instead of just having a million sequences come from one sample, you can have a million sequences divided by say a thousand samples, and so and then once the sequence the sequences come out, they have this bar tag. You go back to where they came from, and you say, okay, even though all these sequences are in the same sequencing reaction, these are from the orange tube, these are from the blue tube, etc. Um, and so this blew open the doors of microbial ecology because we went from being natural historians to being hypothesis testing scientists. And so that was really great because it made microbial ecology much more interesting and uh, so that's, that's good. And so just a major breakthrough. Um, so just as, as an example of that, in 2008 I wrote a, a paper of flea associated bacteria communities and I had 10 fleas and 350 DNA sequences. Okay. A year later, I wrote a paper it was looking at 230 fleas sampled across space and time, 115,000 DNA sequences. And that was, that was actually cheaper to do that than to do that project. Um, and so just right there, I can now, instead of just saying, oh, look, what, here's what looks in 10 fleas, I can say, how are these communities shifting over space, over time, across flea species? And that's where the hypothesis testing comes in. And it kept getting better. So 2011, I had, a, I had a 380 samples <coughs> a million sequences. My last round that came in a few months ago was 368 samples and 16 million sequences. And so it's just been a real sort of avalanche of data. Um, so just, just as a cost, cost benefit, basically. So in 2008, that flea study, it was $7 a sequence. Then that next, that next study got down to $0.03 cents a sequence. Now we're down to like .004 cents a sequence. And so it's really become economically viable. And so this, this explosion of data capabilities and, and the cost has really been nice at another level to be a microbial ecologist because you show up at a new place like Montana State and I run into Laura who says, hey, I've got this cool bee project, maybe we should do something. Or I talk to Jeff Poole and he says, maybe we should do something in NIAC. And talk to Y Cross and he says, we should do, no one's doing microbes in Iceland. And so there's just sort of a adaptive radiation of uh, landing as a microbial ecologist in a new spot. So that's really nice. Uh, so just a general framework of sort of how I interpret this data once it, once it comes back. So all those DNA sequences is how we describe <clears throat> bacterial communities. So these are just individual bacterial communities that could be from soil or an insect or, or what have you. And then there's a regional pool of, of diversity. And so how that regional pool gets filtered into an individual sample is a process of either environmental or historical filters. So either some sort of ecological effects or stochastic processes that are, are uh, driving community assembly. <clears throat> and we use that sequence data to create uh, huge phylogenetic trees. So like the, the bee project had 6,000 bacterial species found in these, in these native bees. And we, we, can, we generate these phylogenetic metrics of the bacteria, and then we can uh, come up with distance matrices. So this is one called Unifrac, uh, developed by Kathy Lozapone and Rob Knight, Colorado. But uh, here, we're just comparing, say, two communities, a red one and a blue one. And in this case on the left, there's, they have no shared branch length, so no shared evolutionary history. They'd have a distance of one. Whereas on the right, in this scenario, the red and blue are more dispersed over that phylogeny, and so they have a, a lower distance. And so if, if you had the exact same members in each community, the distance would be zero. No evolutionary overlap, you go to a distance of one. And then we, 
we do that pairwise comparisons between every all communities in, in the analysis. And so in this case, there's just four, say red and yellow. These are sharing a lot of a lot of evolutionary history together. And so you see these these high uh, dis or low distance values between red and yellow. Same with green and blue. They've got low distance values, but if you look at green versus yellow or red, they've got high distance values. Anyway, that turn, that gets turned into a huge pairwise matrix. And then we can do things like principal coordinate analysis to, or UPGMA to make some pretty figures to show how they're, they're clustering. And then there's traditional stats we can run to. That's, that's sort of the basics of the, of the methods. <coughs> and then the, the hypothesis testing, we could say in this, in this scenario, does taxonomy of insects, so do more related insects have more similar bacterial communities? So this green and brown guy are clustering together with, to the exclusion of the red and, and gray guy. Or, or does diet have the effect? So does eating plants make you cluster together versus eating a mammal? And so this is the type of hypothesis, kind of the way we can generate hypotheses and, and test them using this sort of data. Okay, so first I want to talk to you about um, this uh, global, global patterns of soil microbes. So this is a paper of mine from 2009. This is the first, one of the first papers ever to use that, that bar tag approach is the first soil paper. And so we looked at soils collected across the Americas. And the reason is these approaches are so powerful, so in this case we looked at acidobacteria, and this is just a pie chart of all cultured bacteria. So we've got like 30,000 genomes from cultured bacteria in orange. And then this blue slice is actually way too big because there's only about 10 um, cultured represent representatives of acidobacteria. And so anything we, the things we need, the things we want to know about how do ecological factors say generate acidobacterial patterns, community assembly patterns. We can't get from cultures. We can't get from uh, ge cultured genomes. And so we need to do these molecular approaches to, to get at this, this group and to get at most, most groups. Um, and so if you look at these soils were collected across, purposely collected across a wide gradient of pH, carbon mineralization, all sorts of soil characteristics. And pH by far had the biggest effect on just relative abundance of acidobacteria. Um, so that seems obvious, I guess, from their name, acidobacteria. But um, <laughs> acidobacteria were actually first discovered in acid, ma uh, acid mine drainage, and so they weren't found in soil till after they were named acidobacteria. But you can see that there's some that live in, in sort of the upper end of basic soils. So they're, they're distributed all across the whole spectrum of soil pHs, but they're, they're definitely high, highly abundant in the low pH. Then, so here's a pico A of community assemblages. And so each dot here is an entire soil community with uh, low pH. So the low pHs all have very similar communities. And then as you go, as you shift, the, the entire community structure is shifting. And so this is showing you that um, in addition to relative abundance of, of the group overall, the, the lineages within the acidobacteria are dramatically shifting based on pH. And so the same acidobacterial lineages you're seeing here are just are absent as you move this way and, and vice versa. <clears throat> okay, so this is a just a chart of phylogenetic evenness. And so as you move up the y-axis here, you become more and more clustered. And what that what that basically means is you're you're selecting for or the environment's selecting for a narrow and narrower phylogenetic uh, breadth. Um, so really clustered groups of, of species can live at these as you depart from neutrality in the soils. And so at a neutral pH soil, it's a really even distribution. But as you depart from neutrality, you're selecting for really specific lineages. So pH has, has a huge effect, and then mean annual precipitation has an effect, but those are, sort of, those are uh, correlated anyway. So the more moisture you have and the more ions you have in your soil, so the lower the pH goes. But then uh, also affects the uh, percent carbon to down ratios, carbon mineralization rates, et cetera. Okay, so that's a global perspective. And then, so are those same factors what's driving community assemblages at the local level? And so at the local level, we're looking at um, soil microbes and trace gas effects. This is with Tim McDermott and John Doerr from, from MSU, and then Brian McGlynn and Diego Riveros from, well, previously from MSU now in North Carolina. Um, and so this is a, a long-term project of Brian McGlynn's at the watershed level. So he's a watershed hydrologist. Uh, John Doerr is a biogeochemist. Tim and I are doing the, the microbes. And so it's a really cool interdisciplinary project 
that's bringing together different expertise. And so Brian's been looking at the, the, how water moves through this watershed for a long time. And uh, we've added, oh, we'll go there yet. We've added um, the microbial component. So we've been, they, they've, been tr they've been tracking how CO2 and methane is, is being emitted or consumed by the environment. Um, and so, like I said, the microbes are doing all that. Um, so let's, let's try to add that component to this system. Um, and so if you're thinking about soil microbes, there's, there's sort of two main, the x-axis here is, is basically water limitation, so percent, percent water-filled pore space. So as you get to about 60 to 70 percent, your water, the microbes are water limited, and so nitrification and methane oxidation is going to be increasing as you increase water. But then you get to a point where that, there's too much, too, well not too much, you get to a point where the water is creating an anoxic environment. And then those nitrification, methane oxidation goes down, but methanogenesis and denitrification go up. And so um, at the beginning of the season, so around, around now, the soils are, are totally saturated, and so probably pumping out a ton of methane. But then as, that, as, that, as the soils dry down over the cross, across the year or the summer, they'll be net consuming methane. So the, the Tenderfoot Creek site, each of these red dots, we have a these gas wells that are drilled at 5, 20, and 50 centimeters. And so we're able to look at CO2, CH4, nitrous oxide fluxes out of these soils. And then at each of these sites, we also have um, microbial, or we have soil samples that we get microbes from. Um, and then these yellow triangles here are eddy flux towers. So we have sort of an ecosystem scale CO2 flux. And then we also look at methane flux at the individual sites out of the soil. So here's our, this sort of our, our ultimate goal is to, to merge something like this. So this is a this is a study that looks at moisture and then different different types of microbes, but it's at a really small scale of 10 meter by 10 meter scale. Um, and then this is sort of a lands, landscape type scale that uh, Diego Rivera created, and this is at, looking at CO2 flux. And so the idea is to be able to map the methanotrophs and methanogens at the landscape scale. That's sort of the ultimate, one of the ultimate goals of this project, to be able to predict how, how landscape scale influences uh, the, the methanotrophs and methanogens. So the data I'm showing right now is from 2012, and so that, that was before I got here. Tim and Diego had a lot of fun digging pits across that watershed. Um, and then we, we took soil samples at these different depths and then compared them to CO2 flux, methane flux, water content. Mm -hmm. So CO2 and methane have a really strong correlation with the microbial community structure. So the overall structure, so if you think back to that graph I showed a little while ago with pH versus that PCOA of pH versus microbes, you could have the same thing with CO2 or CH4 in the Tenderfoot Creek system. So it's not, it's not driven by pH like it is at the global scale, but there's a really strong correlation between the microbial community and gas flux and water content. And then we can look at specific <laughs> specific lineages of those microbes. So as CH4 goes up, so do proteobacteria. Whereas as CH4 goes up, micro microbia just, just drop out. And then the nice thing about the being interested in soil methane is that the methanotrophs and methanogens are readily identified from the 16 s marker gene that we use. And so here's <clears throat> Uh, five different classes of, of methanotrophs in the soils uh, versus, just as a relative abundance, versus methane concentrations. And so you, you can see on this y-axis, they're only, they're peaking out at like 0.8%. So really, these are the main consumers of methane for the terrestrial ecosystem, and they're only at, say, 1% within a, within a soil community. So in 2013, Tim and Keenan and I went every 10 to 14 days and sampled soil from each of these sites. And so that data should be coming back in a couple weeks, hopefully. And so there we have about 500 samples. And they're, they go from that beginning of that June soil saturation point through the end of the, of the summer dry down through September. Um, so it's going to be a really massive and, and pretty amazing data set. So to be, able to, to be able to track methane and CO2 flux across an entire summer across a watershed and having um, 
co-occurring microbial samples across that whole summer is, is, is pretty um, novel. So this, this is going to be really cool to, to uh, be working on over the next month or so. Okay, so the next thing I want to talk about was this microbial ecology of native bees. This is with uh, Laura Burkle in the ecology department. And so sort of the system is we've, we've, there's all these bees. We looked at 16 species of bees, but some of them are, are specialists where they only feed on a single flower, whereas others are more generalists. And so we were wondering, does feed, how, does, how does the feeding strategy affect the microbial community composition of these, of these organisms? And is there any, are there any effects? Um, so if you think of insect-associated bacteria, their symbionts range from ob completely obligate, where they're ne ne <coughs> necessary for survival. So the classic example is the aphid buchnera system, where the, the aphids are dependent on their symbionts to run key, biochem key biochemical processes. Uh, the facultative symbionts, which are potentially beneficial given the right environmental stresses, to neutrally, neutral environmentally acquired bacteria to disease agents. So those are sort of the, the members of an insect, or the individual insect. So I had a paper that came out last year that was looking at cross taxon analyses of insect-associated bacteria. So here we looked at um, like 40, 40 species of insects. We had replicates for each species, and so we were able to look at within versus among in individual insects. So here on the y-axis is community dissimilarity. So the lower down you are, the more similar you are. So within a species, they have very similar communities to one another. As you move back in taxonomy, you have less and less similar. And so the, 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 by far the driving force of, of what lives in an insect is how related they are to one another. <laughs> but if we look within, within individual insects, so here each, each of these is an individual insect and each specific row is, or each, each of these is in species, each row is an individual insect. So these, are, these in red are just <coughs> examples of variation within an insect species. So there's variation at the community level within a species and what, what types of processes or ecological factors are going to be driving that. There's, there's a separate study on uh, uh, Hawaiian aphids that I worked on. And in this case, we found that although the species had the biggest effect, if you looked within species, they're geographically separated. So each island had its own microbial community. And so I've, I've also worked on fleas where there's geographic separation. So there's, there's a geographic effects on, on species communities. And then this is just an example of how the bacterial communities of an insect can have actual effects on the function of that insect. And so these are transmission studies of bubonic plague. So this is from my, my postdoc work at the CDC. And so we had basically notobiotic fleas, where these fleas are kept in captivity for 15 years, which is a lot of generations in, in, of fleas. And they were kept in sterile media, 70% um, humidity, really, really controlled conditions, and they've lost all their bacteria. And so we, do, we were doing all these transmission studies, and I thought, well, what if, what if the actual bacteria within a flea can affect disease transmission? And so we took these, these germ-free fleas and expose one group to soil and another group to wild flea feces. So in, that, in this treatment, I just went and grabbed some soil from a prairie dog colony. And in this treatment, I, went, I caught about 1,000 fleas and just let them live and inoculate this sterile media for about a week. Um, and, and then both those treatments, especially the soil treatment, more than doubled transmission of plague. So something about having those, that native microbial community within the flea was doubling the transmission rates. And so just an example of how the bacterial communities of insects that have, can have a real functional consequence. Um, and then the, the uh, transition efficiency of those fleas in that study also uh, more than doubled by exposing them to those, those uh, wild type bacterial communities. So with the bees, this is a, this, these are from Mount Ellis, just sort of down in this um, bottom right hand corner of the picture. So these are all collected just a couple miles from here. And then just keep in mind, there's, you can see some agricultural lands in here too. So there's native flowers that the bees can forage on, but there's also agricultural land. And then some ur semi-urban development, 
with their gardens, et cetera. So those were the plants of the area. So we looked at 16 species of bees from uh, seven genera. And these are just a few of the wild plants that are out there, but there's another 15 or so plants that they're, they're feeding off of. Um, and so again, this is just that, that framework of how we're going to compare these samples. So we've got that regional diversity, say, of all the bacteria from all the fleas, and how are they, or sorry, bees, how are they, what's the filter that's, that's um, filtering that regional bacterial diversity to the individual bees? Um, so here's just species richness. So here's the number of species of bacteria we see on these individual bee species. Actually, that's interesting. Um, it's not that interesting, but anytime you write a paper, you always have to put this in because someone will ask for it. So. Um, and then here's a, so this is a, a tree of trees. And so it's a cluster. Each tip is is the whole bacterial community of a bee. So um, it's a clustering of the bacterial communities. And then each color is a is a specific <coughs> uh, bee family. So the the yellow is Apidae. The red is the Andrenidae, blue is And so you'll see that for the most part they're clustering together, um, but then you'll see one that's sort of sort of out. And so there's sort of a, a general uh, bee family effect, but there's some bees that can have a, a community that looks much much more like a different uh, bee, bee species or bee family. And then if we do the statistics on that, the, the bee taxonomy has the greatest effect on, on what's driving community assemblage patterns. Um, and then plant species, so we have this data set is, we know the bee species and we know the plant that it, the bee was collected off of. So that has a significant, a little smaller significant effect. And then if the, the bee times plant is giving, is sort of explaining the most variation. So <clears throat> that's pretty interesting. Um, but then what's also cool about this data set is, like I brought up earlier, that these chloroplasts are really an ancient bacteria symbiosis. And so the markers were used also amplifies all the chloroplasts that are associated with the bee species. And so all the pollen and, and plants that they've picked up are also amplified. And so we can, instead of just using that plant that they were picked up off as the plant, we can use the chloroplast data set to look at what they're visiting. So here, I'll just remind myself, we've got um, generalists in red and specialists in blue. And you can kind of see that they're really both sort of all over the place. So even if you're a, a quote specialist, you might you might be visiting, you might have 14 different plants that you visited based on your chloroplast set. And then a lot, and some of those that we're picking up were not even any of the, of the, uh, the plants or flowers in our, that were part of our study system. They're matching to things like beans or, or wheat. And so it could be that these native bees are also are, uh, off, off foraging on those agricultural lands also. So there is, there is actually, uh, the generalists do have more number of observed species than, than specialists, um, but there's not really a huge difference there. And so um, I presented this on Monday at Montana, and, and John McCutcheon said, well, you should look at a, a species area curve because, you know, the specialists, like, you could be picking up pollen from another, the bees are going all over the place, so the generalists might be leaving pollen on a, a plant that the specialists are visiting and picking it up that way. So I did that, but there's really not much of a difference. So the specialists do have a little bit more of a, I guess I did this, I mean, that's really a small small difference between those species area curves. So I don't think that's what's going on. Um, so it looks like the specialists are maybe not as specialists as, as we thought, or there's just so much, there's so much movement of pollen from all over the place that they're both getting exposed to the same, same plants. Okay, so um, that's the end of the bee story. So the the flood the uh, floodplain microbial ecology takes place in the Nyack floodplain, which is a long-term study site of the Flathead Biological Station, and this is work in conjunction with Jack Stanford from the Flathead Biological Station and Jeff Poole, who's from here, and Jack's uh, grad student Amanda Delvicia. And so. This is another one of those systems like TCEF where there's biogeochemists and hydrologists working in the system, but no, no microbial ecologists. And so uh, similarly, there's these wells that are all over this floodplain down to about six meters of depth. And um, 
most of the bio biogeochemistry that happens in the floodplain are not actually in the river, but in that in that floodplain in the in the saturated soils. And so the idea is, can we look at the microbial communities in those in that floodplain and correlate it to things like dissolved oxygen or percent saturation of oxygen, residence time, and uh, so this past summer, uh, tapped into Keenan again. He went up there and collected. We, we dropped down these sterile gravel bags and let, let them uh, accumulate biofilm for two weeks. And then Keenan brought them up, and we extracted the DNA from them. Did the microbial work. Matt, I was analyzing just this morning before I came over. And there's, there's a really strong, effective well. So the depth in the well isn't that important. But if you're within that well, you have a very similar microbial community. Um, which would indicate maybe there's some sort of patchy spatial dynamics that's, that's driving microbial communities in the floodplain. And then the only environmental factor that <clears throat> has a significant effect is percent saturation of oxygen, which you would think would be predicted by residence time. But so residence time is just how long it takes for that water to move through a specific spot, but that has no, absolutely no effect. So very preliminary to start analyzing that um, Friday and this morning. So. Um, it's all new, new data. And then what I'm going to say about that. And then the final project I started is this effect of temperature on, on microbial communities. And so this was <coughs> in the NIAC, or not NIAC, sorry. This is in Iceland. Um, and this is a really unique watershed in that there's a variety of streams across this watershed. They all have the same source water, same water chemistry, uh, same sediment characteristics but vary in temperature from about 4 degrees Celsius to 25 degrees Celsius. And so it's, it's heated indirectly by geothermal ac activity underneath the soil. And so you could have a similar system in, well, we have a similar system in Yellowstone, but there the water is generally heated directly. And so the, the geothermal activity is radically altering iron and sulfur uh, chemistry. And we're, so here the water chemistry is really al almost identical between the streams. So we have a landscape scale where we looked at uh, 13 streams, naturally ranging from 4 degrees to 25 degrees. Um, and those, those shift throughout the communities, shift dramatically across that, that temperature um, gradient. And then there's more of a, uh, I don't have a picture of it, but there's a, a sort of a midterm warming where there's one stream of that about 8C and the stream next to it was 20. And so we piped. I say we, but it's really they. They pipe water over to that warming stream, and sort of like a, a work cooler, or work cooler if you're a brewer, goes through a bunch of copper tubing, gets heated up, and then back into the original stream. So it's that exact same water getting warmed and put back in. And we have above and below samples two years before and two years after. Um, and then finally, there's this, this channel system that Tanner and an engineer from Alabama developed. And then we, it's just this open air chamber that is continuously flowing water at 5, 10, 15, 20, and 25 degrees. And we had sterile tiles that we allowed um, biofilm to form on. And that, that's, actually, that's a really, really strong difference in the microbial communities as you go from 5 to 25. So um, this is a really cool, cool system, which hopefully we're going to be able to do some more, some more work in. And that's about it. So thanks to the IOE for funding uh, a lot of that sequencing work and for funding TCEF and my salary. <laughs> um, if you're working in, in a set of communities, say in the Riverside community, there ought to be a lot of change in communities across time. Uh, if you try going the other direction, if you work off into the insect gut, maybe those bees, how much variation across time do you think there'd be there? Maybe they change pollen sources. So is it within an individual or at the community level? Well, yeah. So within the individual, it's hard because it's, you sort of kill the insect when you sample it. <laughs> um, but if you look at the community level, so I, I sampled a, a lot of fleas in 2004, and then from the same colonies again in 2007, and there was a dramatic shift. So that's the biggest effect was over time. And that makes sense. So with, with uh, disease dynamics, too, there's, there's temporal variation in disease prevalence. And so it could be that these certain microbial communities allow a disease to enter the system or, or, or not. So there's, there's definitely time at the community level. The individual level, um, 
<laughs> the, at the individual level, um, presumably there is change. You could but, do that with cows, for example. Easier to yeah. have one cow. Yeah. You could, yeah. And you could, yeah, especially the rumen, because you can just sort of go in there, get the mouth, and come back out. Yeah. Do you um, put your, do you, oh, sorry. Do you put your um, sequence together to look at um, mutation when you're looking at soil bacteria, or are you, are you looking at um, just a relative abundance? Mutations of a specific lineage? Well, we're, I mean. Do you know if the bacteria mutate as well? Well, I mean, all the all the sequence identity differences are due to mutations, and so we're if we're looking at all we're looking at all bacterial diversity. So we're looking at sort of the cumulative cumulative effect of a few billion years of mutations. And I'm um, just looking at wondering if you're looking at rates of mutations that aren't millions of years. I don't think you could do that with this. You could probably do that if you had a more focused primer. So I mean, these primers are picking up billions of years worth of evolution. So if you had a more, if you had a narrow focus and you want to look at a specific lineage, you could do that. Or if you wanted, yeah, you could do that, but not with this, say not with this particular data set. Do you want to answer Jack's Good question? question. Yeah. Jack Stanford asks, is there a net export of methane from the soil that can No. I think there's a net, <laughs> net consumption of methane. Yeah. <laughs> I have to repeat it. Okay. Jack, can you hear me? <laughs> <laughs> so Jack's question is if there's a, a, net, a net, what is it? net export of methane from Tenerife Creek. And now, so it's, there's a net consumption of methane at Tenerife Creek, although it's seasonal. So I'd, I would guess in early June there's a net export of methane. And that's going to, but over the, source, over the course of the season, it's net. Uptake. Sort of following on Tad's question, I mean, can you go in and look at DO every five minutes in some of these wells and then ask the question, you know, to what extent are the microbial communities changing at a, uh, I no, mean, you have, such cheap, <laughs> cheap, you, you have such cheap processing rates that you highlighted, and I could see the value of that across space, but then also really going to time and getting into that. Not five minutes, maybe a, like okay. da maybe daily. Sure, yeah. sure. Sure. Yeah, you just need someone at the well bringing gravel bags up and processing it. Um, yeah. And I believe with your bee data set, it was all the microbes that were internal to the bee, right? You didn't like surface, surface sterilize and take the whole bee. You preserved the sample, right? So then all yeah. that wheat pollen or chloroplast that you detect was actually inside the bee, right? Presumably. Yeah, they're soaked in bleach for 30 seconds prior to extraction. So they were surface sterilized. Mm -hmm. um, whether that got rid of all, of the, I, I, I doubt that got rid of all of the pollen, the majority. Of the, but most of it. Yeah. I know your NIAC stuff is kind of not fully processed, right? But you mentioned that there was a well, locations of wells, or the well themselves drove the microbial population. Yeah, the site. So the site. Yeah. Yeah. So we had, we, had, we had different depths of the same well. Oh. And so those, even, even at different depths in the same well, are more similar to each other than they were across, across other, relative to other wells. So in the EPSCOR proposal, we said microbial ecology is sort of a black box in ecosystem modeling where we just, you know, put stuff in and get it out, but we don't really understand where, how it works. And, and so you've done all these projects on all these different topics, and I just wondered what your sense is of what's generalizable. So you pose those two hypotheses: is it food? Is it evolution? I mean, what what's your what can I take back as a non-specialist? Um, as a general, yeah. Well, yeah. Well, there's definitely environmental drivers that are affecting which microbes live where. And so, I mean, the big question is how how are say future environmental effects going to be driving the future microbial communities, and then how's that going to affect that the loop? Because the microbes, the microbial community is affecting the ecosystem, ecosystem services or the ecosystem processes, which is then affecting the microbes. Yeah, so I think the, the big question is how, how will changing the microbes then affect the ecosystem processes? 
And so <coughs> we, we know that different groups are responding differently because otherwise we wouldn't be seeing significant effects. Uh -huh. And so I think what, what's next is how are, how are function, how's, how's um, functional potential of those different groups of bacteria, how are those affected? So can it, does that make sense? So are you, is it going to be a different answer for every system? System, or are you kind of converging yeah, on I think some so. common? No. System? Well, yeah, yeah. I think it's going to be different for every system. Hmm. And and scale, I think, is also going to be driven by moisture. Driven by. I say moisture. Yeah, is a huge one for terrestrial ecosystem processes. I mean, moisture may not. I'd say temperature is probably a bigger deal for say insects and insect symbionts. Um, like one thing that's really interesting about insect symbionts is the symbionts themselves often have a certain narrow temperature range that they're, that they're able to live in. And if you heat, one way of getting of ridding an insect of its symbionts is to heat shock them. So the insect doesn't die from that heat shock, but it kills off the microbes because they're so sensitive to it. Huh. Um, so that could be something really interesting at the, I mean, that's all lab-based mm -hmm. stuff, but that could be really interesting at the ecosystem scale as, as temperature increases. How's it going to affect insects and my own symbioses? Yeah. Do you think there's a legacy effect in soils on microbial communities? So if I change, say I cultivate a soil, and yet um, for thousands of years it was a grassland community, we expect that the components of that soil contain some reflection of that legacy. Do you think you could see that in communities and how they yeah, depends on the time scale you're talking about, I guess. I mean, I think once it's been cultivated, if you're cultivating for, say, 40 years or something, you've probably lost most of that. Legacy. Well, and yet we think we have organic matter that has stuck around for 10,000 years. So it was, I don't know, something in your description, maybe the, the topography at PSAF, thinking about how those specific conditions of soil drive community diversity, do, might we see that effect through time? Um, and especially if we have a major perturbation that changes um, changes the soil environment a lot. Yeah, I mean, that, I mean the microbes can change so fast though that there there may I mean there probably is some sort of legacy effect at the community level, but there's microbes can change. <coughs> We're going to see changes in the same exact soil. I mean, same soil cores are 20 centimeters away from each other. We'll see change over the course of the summer, and so they they they're change really rapidly, the community level. The organic matter, yeah, that's going to, that takes longer to maybe. Well, and to some degree, the community must reflect that constituent, right? And so maybe there's a rapid change, and yet you see. Yeah, yeah. You know. so there's not, there's, yeah, there's not like complete turnover. And a lot of that, and a lot of that changes due to relative abundance changes, too. So if you, you sample deep enough, and there could be some microbes holding on from 50 years ago in that agricultural soil, it's hypothetical agricultural soil. but. They haven't. They haven't had the right conditions to turn on and become abundant again yet. Yeah. We thought about using other molecular techniques to look at uh, these sort of microbial community functions in the environment. So looking at the proteome or the metabolome of these communities. Yeah. Yeah. Metagenomics, transcriptomics. It's, yeah. If there's, if we get money. Yeah. <laughs> and then, yeah. Metabolomics. Metabolomics would be really great. You guys have only been sampling the microbial communities at uh, TSEP for a few seasons. Do you, yeah, oh, sorry. Go. Do you expect it to be really, to, to the whole systems to change significantly on very wet summers or very, you know, during drought periods? I mean, you're kind of getting average conditions, I would guess, last couple of years in general. Do you think it'll um, change dramatically during those? I think, I think what we'll be able to do just from last summer is kind of be able to predict how Soil moisture is, I mean, that's the main driver, I think, here, is how soil moisture driving communities. And then you can, you can sort of just measure soil moisture, and you can probably predict really accurately what microbes are there. So I don't think it matters necessarily. I mean, if it's fully saturated, it's fully saturated until it stops being fully saturated. And so th there might be shifts in, in the water content, but I don't think it's going to, I don't think that is that interannual variation is going to be driving the overall community assembly, is my guess. Yep. I'll just jump into some data that, that Ryan may not uh, um, have, had, have access to. 
um, with some of the other analyses that from our collaborator Lincoln is showing that um, the microbial communities in the riparian zone is just, just different, just fundamentally different from those we see in the upland um, forested region. Um, and we will be capturing a range of environmental conditions going from very saturated cold soil in the spring all the way through to optimum conditions which you might consider optimum during, say, early to mid-July, on through to soil dry down and shut down, you know, very dry soils where it was impossible to get soil cores. I mean, it was just like talcum powder. So we will get a range of conditions that will represent different environmental conditions that those environments um, normally see in any one of the annual space and time. Yes? I'm wondering, um, if the soil samples you were collecting for the microbial community was the same depth that the methane was coming out of. Just because if you, thinking if you don't find a really good correlation, could it be that some of that methane is getting oxidized when it's coming out so that if you look at your microbial community and it's up here, but your methane is coming from down here, you might not actually find a good correlation. Yeah, so we have methane at 5, 20, and 50 centimeters for each site. And we have soil from each of those depths too. Oh, you do? Okay, yeah. so you're correlating with the correct depth. Yeah. Um, but, I mean, at any depth, that methane's going to be coming, you know, percolating up through. So I think that's as good as we can do it. Thinking like in, in very wet, can, like in the spring, it could be coming out as CO2. Yeah, there could be methane, methanogens lower at 50 centimeters, say, and methanotros at 20. Is that what you mean? I just mean just the methane itself just getting oxidized as it's coming through. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and that's why that's probably why we had that methanotrust versus methane concentration of methane exactly. going up again. Your methanotrust going up. Yeah. They're, they're taking that methane up. Yeah. With your opening statement, you said that the these, uh -oh. these guys <laughs> were all of the uh, that it really was all micro uh -huh. that it was all the breakdown and recycling and so on. So I just want to try you on this. Oh, it seems to me that the plants, I'm representing jaw here. <laughs> <laughs> it seems to me the plants have at least an equal force in the sense that they are producing all that stuff to break down. Now, if you ask me the question, I know how I'd respond. But. Well, so, well, like I said, the plants are using a chloroplast. It's just a bacteria. Oh, that's anyway. cool. I don't respond. <laughs> 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 Eight plus. <laughs> okay. Well, great. Thanks, Brian.